السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. You see, we are living at a time when uh, we can all agree that this is the best civilization created by man. Anybody here disagree with that? Of course you won't. At least in material terms, we are the best civilization ever created. But it's questionable whether in spiritual terms we can live up to what our Creator expects from us. But at the same time, people are talking about end of society, end of nature, end of the world, collapsing environment, collapsing ecosystems, collapsing biodiversity. So where are we? And also, scientists have been debating whether to call us, the human race, a force of nature. Are we a force of nature? So this geological time, which is the Holocene, people are call, trying to call it the Anthropocene, the age of the human. We have changed time. We have changed geology. So what I'm going to speak to you about for the next 10 or so minutes is to start a conversation to ask some questions that you can talk to yourselves and your colleagues at work, at college, at school, wherever, because times are important. Times are dangerous. Times are challenging. So I call my talk, Make or Break. Make or Break what? Make or break human society, make or break human civilization. My first thoughts about this are to make sense of the challenges we face today, we need to raise our level of consciousness to another plane of reality. We cannot continue to think like we have been thinking, because that thinking is, will keep us behind. We need fresh thinking to free ourselves from, the, from what we call modernity. We need, to free, we need to fresh thinking to free ourselves from the modern mindset that has locked us into a destructive linear process, a linear process, whereas the reality of existence is cyclical. The secular world with its questionable definition of progress, ignores this existential reality. Derived from enlightenment thinking, it saw history as one continual improvement in only one direction. We can take from a finite planet as much as we want, and we are not depleting any resources. That's the mindset. That's the economic mindset. We can take, we can take, but we have no idea that we are depleting creation. This materialistic outlook has brought us in the new millennium to global systems collapse. The primary reality of connectedness, everything is connected to each other, reminds us there is not a thing we can do without it ultimately impacting on the natural world, and that is not even sneeze. We have lost sight of the reality that we are deeply embedded, deeply locked into the natural world. Muslims, in common with other faiths, have abandoned this, this truth and survive today mainly in private, ritualized forms. The loss of biodiversity today is alarming, but we need to remind ourselves that there has been a massive loss of cultural diversity in the past 500 years since Columbus and Vasco da Gama made their historic voyages. The very same, we have lost the very same cultural diversity that protected the planet. However, there is wide scope for re recovering 
humankind's balance, the mizan, with the natural world. If only this opportunity is grasped. As Allah says in Quran, He, Allah, set up the balance, the mizan. Allah tadghafil mizan. So that they may, they may not exceed the balance. Weigh with justice and do not fall short in the balance. So how did this, this deconstruction process of human society take place? We are now governed by a hegemonic global political economy which has assumed the proportions of religious belief. The linear process I referred to earlier promises heaven on earth whilst at the same time proceeding to destroy us with it. The global footprint network observes, and I quote, since the 1970s, humanity has been in ecological overshoot. It now takes the earth 20 months to regenerate what we use in one year. The sustain sustainability agenda does not deal with the unsustainable behavior of the rich, developed world. This raises other questions like, is there a limit to prosperity? Are there any prospects of global equity where we can all have fair shares of the gifts that nature provides us? Will the developed nations tighten their belts like people who are living in Western Europe, in the UK and France and Germany and all these people, will we tighten our belts to enable the sustainable development agenda to work in the poorer parts of the world without creating further havoc and more climate change and more loss of biodiversity to our only home? The economic growth agenda is joined at the hip with debt. The Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development reports that corporate debt poses threat to the global economy. This is estimated at $13 trillion and growing. International Monetary Fund, IMF, reports that global debt has reached an all-time high of $184 trillion in nominal terms, the equivalent of 225% of GDP in 2017. We can now begin to discern, recognize the connections between debt the economic growth agenda, we all want more, we all want to grow economies, and the ecological crisis. We have the deep connection with the way we run our economies and the ecological crisis. Debt is virus money created by the fractional reserve banking system from nothing and lives off usury, interest, riba, where it is totally forbidden in Islam. Quran says, those who take riba will rise up on the day of reckoning like someone tormented by shaitan's touch. So it is time to redefine buzzwords, these words we are familiar with, such as prosperity. Now who's going to redefine prosperity? Progress, what is progress? What is development? What is economic, economic growth? I propose that we ditch these terms altogether and replace them with one idea, and that is equity, justice, adul. The UK-based and well-respected New Econ Economics Foundation observes, and I quote, nothing short of a great transition to a new economy is necessary and desirable, and also possible. Business as usual has failed. Yet, prime ministers, finance ministers, governors of central banks are still running around, trying to tell the people and convince us that this is not the case. That this is not the case. The problem is systemic. And for now, we are merely tinkering with technicalities. Lifestyle change based on real money is now urgently called for if we are to avoid planetary collapse. So, what part can Muslims play in this? What can we give the world that is positive? How can we assume, resume a leadership 
that we once had, and be positive about the human race in its totality. Now, environment, I've often been asked, what has Islam got to do with environmentalism? Environmentalism, and I say everything. Environmentalism, although not expressed as such, is deeply embedded in the matrix of Islam. It is at its simplest level about good manners. It is about personal behavior and how it shows itself in our relationships with others, with other sentient beings, with the natural world, how we behave, good behavior with the natural world. The, the exemplar is Prophet Muhammad And it grew from the foundations he established into a range of rules and institutions that manifested an expression of his life in a way that was truly holistic. The holistic ethic is integrated into the Islamic worldview and is encapsulated in the following verses. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa fil ardi ayatul lil muqhineen wa fi anfusikum afalatu psirun. There are signs, ayat, on the earth for people with certainty. And ayat in yourselves as well. Do you not then see? The term ayat in the Quran describes the natural world, which scholars refer to as the natural Quran. The natural world is the natural Quran. The earth is the Quran of Allah's creation. And the signs in the self, which are both inwardly and outwardly manifest, is a reflection how we relate to his creation. The Islamic Foundation for Ecology and Environmental Sciences, the organization I have been running for the past 40 years, has developed an identity which is recognized for its forward thinking at one end of the spectrum and for establishing projects which gives meaning to the Islamic environmental ethic at the other. Here are just two examples. We were co-conveners with the Islamic Relief uh, of the symposium that produced the Islamic Declaration on Climate Change in 2015. That, I'm pleased to say, has been transferred in, uh, translated into French as well, and it is on our website. It's been translated in te 10 languages, French included, and our strategy has been to make these resources available to mosques and community centers throughout the Islamic world and follow this up with training appropriate to local conditions. At the other end of the spectrum, we stopped the use of dynamite for fishing in Zanzibar in our first pilot project in 1999, using the Quran only. These success stories have been based on two concepts. They have matured in the course of our work. The first is what we call ilmul khalq, knowledge of creation. There are nearly 260 verses in the Quran which talk about khalq. Khalq, khaliq, khalq. And environmental teaching derived entirely from the Quran. And the second is a codification of what we call fiqh al biya evolved over the centuries. This undertaking, which we have adapted to our work, has been pioneered by Indonesian scholars. I see these resources giving the opportunity, giving Muslims the opportunity to be global leaders in environmental protection if they would only accept the challenge. Because the fiqh is there, and all we have to do is understand it and apply it. Muslims now have the opportunity to regain the initiative they have lost and give the leadership that will bring fresh hope to the world. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Will they, will we rise to the occasion? Assalamu alaikum.